Welcome back. This is section 10.2, systems of linear equations and several variables. So remember in section 10.1, we looked at two variable equations. Now we're gonna look at systems where we have more than two variables and how do we solve for all of those variables? All right, so our first example here, we've got x minus two y equals, minus z equals one and y plus two z equals five. And then our final equation is z equals three. So notice we've got three different variables here, x, y, and z. And therefore, we actually need three equations if we're going to be able to actually solve this system. So in this case, we already actually have one of our variables that's solved. So if we look at this last equation, we know that z is equal to three. So this is actually going to be a pretty basic one where we can just start back substituting into our previous equations to actually find the values of the other variables. So I'm just going to take this z value. I'm going to substitute it into that second equation there, and we'll have y plus two times the z value, which is three, and that should be equal to five. All right, now we're just gonna solve for y. Two times three is six, so y plus six equals five. And then if we subtract the six, we'll get y equals negative one. All right, so now we know the values of z and y, so then we can actually take both of those values, go to our first equation, plug both of those in, and that should give us the value for x. We'll have x minus two times our y value, which is negative one, minus the z value, which is three, and that should equal one. And now we simplify. So minus two times a negative one gives us a plus two. Minus three equals one. Two minus three is negative one. So we have x minus one equals one. And then we can just add one to both sides here. So you get x equals two. Once we have the values of all three of our variables, just like in the previous section, we wrote our answer as ordered pairs. This time we have three values, so we call it an ordered triple. We're going to write the x value first, so that's two. Then the y value comes next, that's negative one. And then finally the z value, which is three. And so our final answer would be this ordered triple, two, negative one, three. In general, we're gonna put these things in alphabetical order. So if your variables were A, B, C, you would put them in that order, A, then B, then C. In this case, we have X, Y, Z, so we put them as X, then Y, then Z. All right, now, if we have some more complicated equations where we can't just take a value and start back substituting, then we can actually apply what's called Gaussian elimination um, to that system to actually get equations in a form where we can start to back substitute. So these are the three things we're allowed to do to our system of equations. We can add a non-zero multiple of one equation to another. Basically, we can multiply an equation by some value, just like we did with the elimination method in the previous section, and then we can add two of those equations together to try to start eliminating a variable. Then we can multiply an equation by a non-zero constant, right? We're allowed to do that because that's not gonna change the values that we get for the variables in that equation if we just multiply everything through by a constant. And then we're also allowed to interchange positions of two equations. So if you want the third equation at the top, you can move it to the top. It's not gonna change the solutions to that system. All right, so we're gonna apply those three things to this system here and see if we can find the values for X, Y, and Z. So first thing I'm going to look for is, do I have a variable that I can eliminate using two of my equations? And the first thing I notice here is that if I combine these first two equations, I have a negative 2y and a positive 2y. So I'm going to work with those two equations first. I'm going to take the x minus 2y plus 3z equals 1. And then the second equation, x plus 2y minus z equals 13. Then I can apply my elimination. So I'm going to add these two together because that's going to automatically cancel out the y terms. That would give us 2x. The negative 2y plus 2y cancels out. 3z minus z is a plus 2z. And then 1 plus 13 is 14. Now notice this time, we still don't have any variable that we can solve for yet because we still have an X and a Z in that equation. So what we're gonna have to do next is choose a different pair of equations and eliminate the exact same variable that we just eliminated. So I just eliminated Y, I need to choose a different pair and eliminate Y. 
Well, if I combine the first equation and the last equation, that will also get rid of the y term. So that's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to take x minus 2y plus 3z equals 1 and 3x plus 2y minus 5z equals 3. So again, I'm going to add those two equations together so I can cancel out my y terms. It's going to give us 4x, negative 3, or sorry, positive 3z plus a negative 5z is going to give us a negative 2z, and then 1 plus 3 should give us 4. Once we've done that by choosing two different pairs of equations and eliminating the same variable, now we have two equations that have the same two variables in them. So I can now work with those two equations and see if I can apply elimination again to eliminate a different variable now. So now I'm going to work with the 2x plus 2z equals 14 and 4x minus 2z equals 4. Okay. And what I noticed this time is I don't need to multiply by anything. If I just add these together, my z terms are going to cancel now. That's going to be my next step. I'm just going to add these two equations. 2x plus 4x gives us 6x. The 2z minus 2z cancels out. And then 14 plus 4 should give us 18 now. Now I have an equation in a single variable, and I can solve for x. So I'm just going to divide both sides by 6, and we get x equals positive 3. Once you know what one of your variables is equal to, now we can begin to back substitute. So now I know that I can use either one of these equations that I found previously that had an x and a z in it, and I can substitute the x value into those to figure out what z is equal to. So I'm just going to use this first one that I solved for here. That's going to give us 2 times the x value, which is 3, plus 2z equals 14. And again, I could have simplified and plugged into 4x minus 2z equals 4 instead. It would give us the same z value. It doesn't matter. If I simplify this now, this is going to give us 6 plus 2z equals 14. Subtract your 6. We get 2z equals 8. And then divide by the 2. So z equals 4. Now, once I know values of two of my variables, I can plug those two values into any one of my equations now to solve for y. So again, it doesn't matter which one. I'm going to get the exact same value for y no matter what. I'll just go with the top equation here. So x is 3 minus 2 times my y value, which is what I'm looking for, plus 3 times the z value, which is 4, and that should equal 1. Let's simplify what we've got here. So we have 3 minus 2y plus 12 equals 1. Combine your like terms. We have negative 2y. 3 plus 12 is 15. That equals 1. Subtract 15 from both sides. Negative 2y equals negative 14. And divide by negative 2. So y equals 7. Then once we have the values of all three of our variables, we write them as an ordered triple and we're done. Make sure you put them in alphabetical order. So x comes first here, 3. y would be next, that's 7. And then finally, the z value, which is 4. So this would be our solution to that system. So again, just to recap, always start by eliminating one of your variables. Whichever one looks like it's going to be easiest to eliminate, start with that one. Then you're going to have to choose a different pair of equations and try to eliminate the exact same variable so that you have two equations now that have the same two variables in them. Once you have that, then we can put those two equations together to eliminate a different variable. And then once we know the value of one of our variables, then it's just a matter of back substituting to find the values of the others. Right. Now, the number of solutions to a linear system like the ones we've been looking at, and the reason these are still linear is because we just have an x to the first, a y to the first, and a z to the first power. Okay, so if you ever have other exponents, then they're not going to be linear anymore. Um, these are just linear equations in three dimensions. 
Right? So for these systems of linear equations, exactly one of these is true. Either the system has one solution, just like in the previous section, the system could have no solution, just like in the previous section, or the system could have infinitely many solutions, just like in the previous section. So even though we're in three dimensions now instead of two dimensions, we still have one of these three things that's gonna happen. We're gonna have one solution where there's one single point in three dimensions where they intersect, or we could have no solution where all three of the planes never intersect, or we could have um, infinitely many solutions where they all intersect along a line, and therefore there's an infinite number of points where those three planes are gonna intersect each other. Okay, so you can see these pictures down at the bottom. The first one here will be an example of number one. Okay, this is exactly one solution. The next one here would have infinitely many solutions, so this is like number three. And then the last one here shows you that we could have three planes where not all three of them ever intersect at the same location, and so this would be no solution like number two. All right, so let's see if we can solve this one. Again, we're going to use that Gaussian elimination that we just looked at before. So my first step is to choose two equations, um, and we're going to work with those to try to eliminate a variable. Now, again, it does not matter which ones we choose or which variable we eliminate first. I'm going to start with my first two equations here, and I'm going to actually try to eliminate the y term. Since I notice I have a 2y and a 2y, the only thing I would need to do in this case is multiplied by a negative one so that I can make that a negative 2y instead. So if we do that, we're going to end up with x plus 2y minus 2z equals one. That's my first equation. Distribute this negative one to everything in the second equation. So we get negative 2x minus 2y plus z equals negative six. Because again, according to those properties, we're allowed to multiply by a non-zero constant, and then we're allowed to actually add any two equations together that we want to. So now I'm going to add these together. That's going to give us a negative x. My y terms are going to cancel. Negative 2z plus z is going to give us negative z. And then 1 plus negative 6 should be negative 5. So now we have one equation in terms of x and z. I need another equation in terms of x and z, so I need to eliminate y again. Again, I need to choose any other pair of equations, so I can't use the same ones. So in this case, I'm going to go with the second and third, because I notice if I have a 4y here, I have a 2y here, I could just multiply this one by a negative 2 and that would give me a negative 4y, which would cancel out the y terms. And again, we're always trying to cancel out the same variable that we canceled out in our first pairing. So we're going to have negative 4x minus 4y plus 2z equals negative 12. Keep the third equation the same, 3x plus 4y minus 3z equals 5. Now we can add those two equations together. Negative 4x plus 3x is negative x. Negative 4y plus 4y cancels out. 2z plus a negative 3z is going to give us a negative 1z. And then negative 12 plus 5 should be negative 7. Now I have my two equations in terms of x and z. Now I can pair those together and try to eliminate another variable. So we'll have negative x minus z equals negative five, negative x minus z equals negative seven. Now in this case, I am gonna to have to multiply one of them by something so that I can actually cancel. So I'll multiply this one by a negative one. We'll keep the top one the same, negative x minus z equals negative five. Bottom equation now becomes a positive x plus z equals seven. And now we can add. And if I do that, negative x plus x cancels out, negative z plus z cancels out. So we actually end up with zero on this side. And then negative five plus seven gives us two. Now the same thing applies that applied back in the previous section. If we get something where all the variables cancel out and we have a true statement, that's infinitely many solutions. If we get a false statement, then we say that there's no solution. In this case, zero is not actually equal to two. So this is a false statement. 
that tells us then that there is no solution to that system. And again, the process is still the same as the first example. Okay, we're always going to first eliminate one variable by pairing two equations, choose a different pairing, eliminate the same variable, take the two equations we now have in those two variables, pair those together. But in this case, if everything cancels out, all the variables cancel out, we look to see do we have a true statement or a false statement. If it's a false statement, no solution. True statement, infinitely many solutions. Let's take a look at this one now. So same thing. I'm going to use my elimination here. I'm going to choose two equations, try to cancel out a variable. I notice right off the bat that negative y and positive y in the first two equations would cancel out, so I'm going to start with those. So we have x minus y plus 5z equals negative 2. We have 2x plus y plus 4z equals 2. I'm going to add those together. This time I don't need to multiply by anything because my y's automatically cancel. x plus 2x is going to give us 3x. y's cancel out. 5z plus 4z is 9z. And negative 2 plus 2 should give us 0. So now again, I need to choose a different pair of equations, and I need to cancel out the y since that's what I canceled out the first time. In this case, if I just multiply the top equation by 4, I can pair it with the bottom equation, and that will cancel out my y term. So that gives us 4x minus 4y plus 20z equals negative 8. And then I'm going to take my bottom equation, keep it the same, 2x plus 4y minus 2z equals 8. Now we add these together. 4x plus 2x is 6x. My negative 4y and 4y cancel each other out. 20z plus negative 2z should give us a positive 18z. And then negative 8 plus 8 is 0. Now I have two equations just in terms of x and z. I can pair those together. So we'll have 3x plus 9z equals 0. 6x plus 18z equals 0. I need to eliminate a variable. I can multiply the top equation here by a negative 2 to make that happen. So that's going to give us negative 6x minus 18z equals 0. And 6x plus 18z equals 0. Add those together. Notice again this time, negative 6x plus 6x cancels out. That's 0. Negative 18z plus 18z also cancels out. So this time we're left with 0 equals 0. Since all of my variables canceled, I know it's either no solution or infinitely many solutions. This time I end up with a true statement, though. So in this case, I can say there are infinitely many solutions. Now, when we have infinitely many solutions, a lot of times in WebAssign, they're going to ask you to actually define what that solution would look like in terms of one of your variables. Um, and so they'll tell you either choose X to be X or choose Z to be Z or something like that. Um, in this case, I'm going to say let's let Z be the thing that we want to define everything in terms of. Okay, So I'm going to take one of these last equations down here. I'm going to let Z equal Z. So in my ordered triple, I know that last term is just going to be a Z. Now I just need to solve in terms of the other variables for Z, right? So I'm going to take this, let's see, I'm going to take the 3X plus 9Z equals 0, and I'm going to solve for X in terms of Z. So I'm going to move the Z to the other side. That will give us 3X equals negative 9Z. Divide by 3, that gives us x equals negative 3z. So now I know my x term <clears throat> in terms of z is going to be negative 3z. Now I need to solve for y. 
well, I know what X is in terms of Z, and I know Z is just going to be Z in this case. So I can plug both of those into any one of my original equations and just solve for Y. The easiest place to solve for Y is that second equation since it's already just one Y. So that's where I'm going to plug in two times the X value, which is negative three Z plus Y plus four Z equals two. Now we simplify and get y by itself. We have negative 6z plus y plus 4z equals 2. Combine like terms, we'll have y minus 2z equals 2. Now I'm just going to move the 2z to the other side by adding it, and so we get 2z plus 2. That is the y value now, and so my y value up here just becomes 2z plus 2. And so this would be my solution this time for my infinitely many solutions where I'm just letting Z be equal to Z. Now, again, it could ask you to solve in terms of X instead, right? In that case, you would just start with the same equation, the 3X plus 9Z equals zero. In that case, you would solve for Z instead because you want to get Z in terms of X. X would just be X. Z would then be in terms of X. And then we could back substitute and get y in terms of x also. So just pay attention to which variable they're asking you to get everything in terms of. Okay, but that process is pretty much the same no matter which variable you choose. Now, before we do the word problem, I'm going to go back to example two and I'm going to show you that we can actually use our calculators to find solutions to these systems also. Okay, so I'm going to switch over my view now to my calculator. And so as long as you have a TI calculator, um, it should look something like this. Um, the TI-83 is a little different, right, um, just in terms of where the button placement is and things like that. Um, but in general, the process is still the same. If you have a different type of calculator, feel free to reach out to me and I'll try to explain how to do it on those also. All right, so the first thing we want to do here is we're going to create um, a matrix for this system um, so that we can actually solve it that way. Now, when I create my matrix, what I'm actually going to do here, let me go back to the other screen so I can write that out. So I'm actually going to put in here the coefficients of each one of my variables and then the constants, okay? So notice here, I have three variables across the top and a constant, so I'm gonna need four entries for this matrix. This is gonna be one, negative two, three, and one. And so again, I'm just including, in this case, each of the coefficients of those variables and then the constant. And make sure that everything's in order here. All right, so the X needs to go in that first column. The negative two comes next, because that's the Y term. Three would be next. And then your constant's always going to go in that last column. Then I'm going to do the same thing with my next equation. So I have a one. We have a positive two. We have a negative one. And then we have a 13. And then finally, x, y, z, and then the constant. I have a 3 as my coefficient of x, 2 as my coefficient of y, negative 5 is my coefficient of z, and then 3 is going to be my coefficient, or sorry, my constant term on the other side. Now, once we have that matrix, okay, and I know we haven't talked about matrices, we're actually going to look at this in more depth in the next section. Um, but I figure while we're here, I'll go ahead and show it to you so that if you want to use this in some of the homework problems, you can actually practice this there also. Okay, so we need to know the dimension of this matrix. Okay, and so the dimensions now, we're always going to do rows first, and then we're going to do columns. Okay, so when I talk about rows, that's running from left to right. So in this case, I have three rows of this matrix. So it's going to be a three by... And then I want my columns, which is the verticals, the things that are running up and down, that's going to be four columns. So my dimensions for that matrix this time are three by four. All right, so now I'm going to go back to my calculator, and I'm actually going to enter this matrix into my calculator. So to get to your matrix, 
It depends on what type of calculator you have. My matrix key is right above my X to the negative one. I have to press the second key first. Like I said, some calculators actually have just a key that says matrix on it. Okay, so just find that and that's where you're gonna go. All right, now we're gonna go over to edit. Now, if you've never used matrices in your calculator before, yours is probably just gonna say one by one there and you'll actually have to change the dimensions, right? Mine already says three by four. Okay, so you need three and then four as your dimensions. Okay, so make sure you change that. Once you do that, it'll actually update your matrix to give you that number of rows and that number of columns. Now I'm gonna actually type in the entries for the matrix that we generated. Okay, so our first row was a one, and then you can just press enter and it'll automatically jump to the next entry, then negative two, then three, and then one was our constant for that equation. Again, once you press enter, it'll jump down to the next row. We can enter that next row. That was one, then two, negative one, 13, and then our last row was three, two, negative five, and three. Now, once you get all of your entries in there, the next step is gonna be to go back to your home screen. So we have to press second quit to get back to the home screen. So that's second and then the mode key right next to the second key, that'll get you back to the home screen. Now our next step is we're gonna go back to that matrix menu. So however you got to matrix the first time, we're gonna go back to matrix. This time though, we're gonna go over to your math column. I'm just gonna go over to math and you're gonna scroll down until you see R, R, E, F. Okay, so notice there's an R, E, F. We don't wanna do that one. We wanna do the other option that says R, R, E, F. That stands for reduced row echelon form. And again, we're gonna talk more about what that means um, in the next section. Okay, but for right now, just select the RREF option. That's the one we wanna go with. So I'll press enter there. And that should give us RREF on our home screen, right? And that's why we have to go back to the home screen first, right? Make sure you exit the matrix and get back here uh, because otherwise it's gonna put that into your matrix instead, which is not what we want. All right, now, we need to tell the calculator which matrix we're actually working with now. So we're gonna go back to that matrix menu again. And wherever you put in your matrix, that's the one we're gonna select, right? I put it in matrix A, so that's the matrix I'm gonna choose. And then we're gonna tell it to take the reduced row echelon form of matrix A. I'm gonna press enter. Now, what we end up with, and I'm gonna actually write this in my slides and go back to that, so I can explain exactly what each one of these numbers mean. So our first row now becomes one, zero, zero, three. Our second row is zero, one, zero, seven. And then our last row is zero, zero, one, four. So by doing reduced row echelon form, now we've created this matrix okay, where we have those values. So that's all we need the calculator for. So now I'm gonna go back to my slides. Okay, and you can see right down here, I've written that matrix. So notice here, remember what we put in the first column were the X coefficients. In the second column, we put the Y coefficients. And in the third column, we put the Z coefficients. Okay, and then our last column was our constant terms. So what this first row tells us now is that if I have a coefficient of one for my X and zeros for my Y and Z, then that constant is gonna be three. Or in other words, one X is equal to three now, so there's your X value. The second row now tells me that if my X and Z values become zero and my Y has a coefficient of one, that one Y is equal to seven, so there's your Y. And then the last row tells me that if my coefficient of z is one and everything else is zero, that one z is equal to four, there is my z value. Okay. So again, this just gives us the values for x, y, and z now 
if we just look at that last column. So again, that's the process now. If you want to use matrices in your calculator, you need to know how to do this by hand because there will be questions on the test where you're asked to do that. But this is a good way to check yourself if you do have a graphing calculator um, or especially on word problems. I'm not going to necessarily require that you show all of your work once you actually set up your systems. You can actually just use the calculator to actually solve at that point once you have them set up. And again, we'll look more at this in the next section um, and go through that process again to solve some of these systems. Now, real quick, I do want to show you this one. I'll do it one more time just to show you what happens with the no solution systems. Okay, so again, I'm going to generate my matrix here. I'm going to have a one, two, negative two, and one as my first row, two, two, negative one, and six as my second row, three, four, negative three, and five as my last row. So I'll go back through those steps one more time here. <clears throat> so again, I'm going to go back to my matrix. I'm going to go over to edit. We still have a three by four matrix this time, three rows and four columns. This time I had one, two, negative two, one, two, two, negative one, and six, three, four, negative three, and five. Again, key step, don't forget to go back to your home screen, second quit. We need the RREF again, so I'm going to go second matrix. And on my calculator, just get to your matrix menu, go all the way down to RREF, get back to your matrix menu, and select the matrix you're working with. So this time, when I do my reduced row echelon form, I get 1, 0, 1, 0. 0, 1, negative 1 1.50, and then finally 0, 0, 0, and 1. And so I wrote that in the notes, so I'm going to go back and we'll talk about what this means. So what I notice here, and really it's just the last line that I'm going to look at. Remember this first column is X, second column is Y, last column is Z. So that last row tells me that 0x plus 0y plus 0z is equal to 1. Well, if I have zeros as coefficients of all those terms, that side's going to be equal to 0. That's not going to be equal to 1, right? And so we know in this case, if all those variables cancel out, which is what that last row shows, and it's equal to something other than 0, that's what tells us now that there is no solution to this system. And so this will also show no solution. If it was infinitely many solutions instead, then you'd have zeros across the entire row there because you'd have zero equals zero instead. And then you could say there's infinitely many solutions in that case. Okay, so that's the only difference between a no solution and infinitely many solutions. We're looking just at that last row. If it's zeros across the board, then it's infinitely many solutions. If it's zeros for the first three entries and then some number other than zero, then we know that zero can't be equal to something other than zero, and we say no solution. All right, so now let's take a look at our last example. So Jason receives an inheritance of $50,000. His financial advisor suggests that he invest this in three mutual funds. Um, one's a money market fund, then a blue chip stock fund, and finally a high tech stock fund. The advisor estimates that the money market fund will return 5% over the next year, blue chip fund 9%, and the high tech fund 16%. Jason wants a total first year return of, let me make sure I have that value, it should be $4,000, sorry about that. Okay. To avoid excessive risk, he decides to invest three times as much in the money market fund as the high tech fund, um, and then we want to know how much is he going to put in each one of his funds. Now, just like the previous section, the first thing we want to do is define our variables. Okay, so we want to figure out what we're actually looking for. 
I want to know how much he puts in each one of these funds. So I'm going to define my variables as the amount of money in each fund that he's putting money into. Okay, so I've got a money market fund, a blue chip stock fund, and a high tech fund. So I'm just going to use variables here, M for money market, B for blue chip, and H for high tech, okay, just so it's easy to remember which one's which. All right, so now I need to generate equations. Well, since I've got three variables, I'm going to need three equations to be able to solve this. The first thing I'm going to look at is my interest. Okay, so I know that he wants to earn $4,000 in this case. And I know what percent interest he makes on each account. So if I set up one equation just to represent interest, that would be money market gives him 5%. I'm going to change that to a decimal. So 0 0.05 times the amount he puts in money market. Plus, then he earns 9% on the blue chip. So that's 0 0.09 times everything he puts in blue chip. He's gonna earn 16% on high tech. That's 0.16 times the high tech. And we wanna earn a total interest amount of $4,000. We want all of that interest to add up to 4,000. So there's one of my equations. Now, we also know that the total amount invested is the inheritance itself. Right? So I know that I'm going to invest all of my money either in money market, blue chip, or high tech. So if I add together my money market, blue chip, and high tech, that total investment now should be the total amount of the inheritance, which was $50,000. So there's my second equation. Now I need one more equation. So I look through and I try to figure out what else do I know. Well, the last thing it tells us is he invests three times as much in the money market fund as the high tech fund. So I can write an equation now to represent that. Now this one's the tricky one to make sure we put values in the right place. Okay, so we want three times as much in money market as high tech, meaning that we need to multiply high tech by three to give us the amount in money market. In other words, Money market is equal to three times high tech. So it's really easy there to multiply the money market by three instead, but then that would mean that the high tech is three times as much as money market. We want the money market to be three times as much as high tech. So it's M equals three H. Now that we've got that, now we can solve that system. Now it's up to you what method you want to use. Like I said, on a test, if you get the system set up, I'm fine if you use your calculator and do matrices. If you don't happen to have a calculator to do that, then you could just do substitution in this case because we already have M equals something. We could back substitute and start to solve that way. Okay, I'm going to use matrices since I already have that. First thing I need to do though is get all of my variables to one side. So I'm gonna rewrite this one now as M minus three H equals zero. So if you're gonna use matrices, just make sure all of your variables are on one side, all of your constants are on the other side. So now my matrix that I can generate from this, I'm gonna have 0 0.05, 0 0.09, 0 0.16, and 4,000. My second row here, all these coefficients are one, and then I have 50,000. And then down here now, my money market is one. I don't have anything in blue chip, so that column is gonna be a zero. I have a negative three for my high tech, and then this side's gonna be equal to zero. So again, use our calculator now so i'll go through that one more time on my calculator second matrix and go over to edit again three rows four columns so my three by four looks good coefficients this time 0 0.05 0 0.09 0 0.16 and then 4000 for my constant and we have one 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 and fifty thousand and the last row, one, zero, negative three, and zero. 
All right, second clip to get back to our home screen, get back to your matrix menu, go over to math, reduce row echelon form, go back to matrix, select the matrix we're working with, and this time again, you can see it gives us our ones, right? So we know we're good there. And then we get all those values in the last column. That's going to be the amount that we want to invest in each one of our funds. Remember, the first column was money market. Second column was blue chip. Last column was high tech. So that tells us then that our money market is going to be 30,000. Our blue chip, we're going to want to invest 10,000. And our high tech we're also going to want to invest 10,000. Okay. And then again, in terms of the context of the problem, these are all dollar amounts. Okay, so just make sure you put dollars on each one of those. So you can see up there at the top, I went ahead and put those values. And again, those are the exact same values you would get if you were to use some other method to solve that system. Right? So feel free to use whatever method you want to. Okay, but if you have access to a calculator on a word problem, once you get the system set up, if you want to use the calculator, that's perfectly fine. All right, so that's all we've got for that section. Um, again, as always, send me questions in WebAssign if you have them. Um, come see me during student hours if you want to ask any specific questions about anything. Um, otherwise, have a great day, and I will see you next time.